Live from the slightly twisted deck bar, it's the Fuji Podcast with Justin Lemieux. Very pleased to have our next guest join us uh, on the show, uh, former Jacksonville Jaguar defensive lineman, spent some time within MMA and now currently works as a Jax sports radio personality with ESPN 690 AM. Uh, so I want to welcome Austin Lane to the show. Thanks for being here, Austin. Dude, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Awesome. No, the pleasure is all mine having you here. I mean, it's, it's always exciting talking to uh, former athletes, especially uh, hometown team players. So uh, yes. I want to jump into that a little bit. Take me through your time kind of in the NFL, getting drafted out of Murray State, um, you know, an yeah. FCS program. What was that like uh, going from being a first team All-American to uh, getting drafted in the fifth round back in 2010? Yeah, it was definitely obviously a crazy transition. You know, when I was at Murray State, I had zero aspirations to play in the NFL. Um, it just so happened that I was surrounded by great coaches and great players, and they, they kind of cultivated the talent out of me. So by the time I reached my junior year, um, there was a good chance of me going to the draft, you know, and going to the NFL and kind of f- fulfilling that dream and everything. Um, as far as the transition, though, like I, I was blessed enough to, when my senior year, I got invited to play at the Senior Bowl. And that was like a last second thing because a player by the name of Jerry Hughes out of TCU opted not to go to the senior bowl, like the last second. So that Wednesday they gave me a call and obviously I couldn't turn that down. So playing the senior bowl, um, kind of helped myself out there a little bit, went to the combine, did that whole thing. And then by the time the draft came around, man, it was just, um, I guess it was kind of like a foregone conclusion. And you mentioned the, uh, the senior bowl and the NFL draft combine, uh, in yeah. your opinion, how important are those to the uh, progression of a player getting into the NFL? And what has the thoughts kind of been for this season with everything being canceled so far? Yeah, you know, so the, the, the combine was kind of a love-hate relationship for me, right? Because you grew up watching everything, you know what it's all about, but nothing can really prepare you for it until you actually go through it. And like, what I mean by that is, like, you know, obviously I trained for the 40-yard dash. I trained for the – I mean, I trained for the broad jump. I trained for the shuttle. But, like, what I wasn't prepared for was, like, the crazy questions that they're going to ask me. You know, like a bunch of questions that I've obviously I've shared them before. But, like, um, if you could kill somebody, how would you do it? Like, that's – to me, that's not a really football-related question. So those things kind of threw me back a little bit. Um, as far as the interview process was really concerned, I thought they went okay. Truth be told, Jackson was probably my worst interview. It was my first one, and I was, like, super nervous. So, uh, you know, so, so that was kind of a thing. But thankfully, uh, I must have passed something because they ended up drafting me. But overall, man, like, the, the combine's important. Um, you know, the pro days that are getting canceled now and everything, those do carry some kind of weight, especially to the guys that are the smaller school guys that are trying to make a name for themselves. But at the end of the day, uh, I think, that, you know, the most important part, whether a team's going to select you or not, is your film. What you put on film is what a team goes by most. And then they go to the combine, they ask you the questions, they interview you, they see your 40-yard dash and all that stuff. And that's important, but not as important as your film. So by the time the combine's over, they have a pretty good idea of where they're going to take you. You know, players taking these visits and stuff like that, now those got canceled, obviously, in the pro days. Those are just kind of some little extra gravy on top. But I don't think they're essential um, unless you're that small school guy who's trying to make a name for himself. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up the small school kind of guy, uh, the feel to it in the film. So when you're playing at those schools, obviously Murray State being an FCS, do you yeah. have an idea that NFL draft scouts are potentially in the stands watching or that they will potentially get this footage at some point? I think as college football fans, we step back and we watch, you know, obviously the SEC games, the ACC mm-hmm. games, and we know these players that are uh, kind of in the spotlight the whole season. But what is it like being at one of those smaller schools uh, playing throughout the season? Yeah, that's a great question, obviously. So, you know, whenever you're at a small school like that, obviously the competition isn't to like an SEC. It's not to a Big Ten. So there's really no excuse for you not to dominate. You know, like if you want to get looks by the NFL, you have to go out there on every single play and, you know, make a name for yourself um you can't afford to loaf you know that's kind of like taking plays off because that will pop up and as far as like having an idea of you know how how many scouts and things were that i mean you know even being an fcs program uh playing in the ovc you know we played the smaller schools but then once or twice a year we play a big school like indiana we played louisville back when they're like number five or number six we played missouri when they're like number four number five so I did play on some big stages, and that helped me out a lot as well. But keep in mind, I mean, even through your college season, scouts come 
in and out of the stadium and like they do interviews and stuff like that. So literally I would go in the morning cause we had practice in the morning at six 30, go do the practice, meet with scouts after that and then go to class. So it was kind of like an everyday thing or whatever like that. But um, as far as like knowing where the scouts are, you have a pretty good idea, but at the same time, I was the type of person just wanted to have fun, man, and enjoy my junior and senior year. Yeah. And I'm sure that was uh, easy to do considering you mentioned you didn't really have those aspirations for the NFL. So you just kind of went out there and, did your yeah. best day in and day out. So it uh, probably helped a little bit, take some stress off, some pressure off. Uh, but just some fun facts um, about Austin Lane being drafted, for those watching at home, uh, was the first player drafted since 1997 out of Murray State when he got drafted in 2010. At the time, was the highest drafted player out of Murray State um, until this past <laughs> season when the Jaguars <laughs> drafted Quincy Williams – yeah. Uh, in the third round. So yeah. uh, pretty, pretty cool uh, remarks, I guess, uh, for, for you being drafted in the fifth round and really kind of putting your, your uh, talents on tape. So transitioning from football, um, you, you retired from football in 2015. And a few short months later, you move into the MMA industry. Tell me a little bit about that transition uh, going from football to MMA. Yeah, I mean, you know, so obviously, I always told myself that if playing ball started to feel like a job and I stopped having fun, um, that's probably been the, the, the moment that I would try to walk away from it. And, you know, I mean, I can go on for hours and hours about the politics of the NFL and stuff like that. But basically uh, what made my decision pretty easy was the last time I got cut from the Chicago Bears. And John Fox, head coach at the time, brought me in his office. You know, this is during OTAs and everything. And he said that, hey, you know, we're going to go in a, we're gonna go in a younger direction is kind of what the quote that he used. At the time, man, like, I was doing yoga. I was feeling good, man. Like, I was feeling like I was in my prime. And he was telling me I was basically too old. I'm like, well, you know, I'm 26, 27 years old. I feel fine, but this is the NFL. This is the NFL. So the reason I got involved in MMA was because when I was in Jacksonville my first couple of years during the off season, I would go to an MMA gym to, you know, increase my hand speed. And it was an MMA gym. So after I started, you know, doing boxing to increase my hand speed, well, I started doing jujitsu, and that was good for my hips and everything. So I just gradually, every single offseason, got more and more and more into it um, to the point where when I was in Chicago for my last couple of years, I was actually going to jujitsu tournaments on the side competing, even though I kind of violated my contract. So I would, like, win a tournament. I couldn't accept the prize money because it would violate my contract. So I'd just go out the back door and say, all right, we'll see you guys later. So I was doing that for a while. But to me, man, um, I had MMA in my back pocket because it's still that brotherhood. It's still that camaraderie. Um, you know, it's, it, it's one of those things where you can always push yourself and see what you're made of. And I probably learned more life lessons right now through MMA than I had playing, you know, ball since I was like five years old. So to me, it was an easy transition, you know, and, and, and thankfully I had that because a lot of guys when they retire, you know, they don't go out their own terms. Someone tells them that they're not good enough and then it is what it is. And a lot of guys kind of get lost because they don't have that fallback plan. Thankfully, I, you know, I had the fallback plan of MMA. And so you're, you're in MMA and then you, uh, I guess, come back to Jacksonville and, and get into Jack's sports radio. I still remember <laughs> yeah. uh, the, cool, the cool moment when Brent Martineau, um, I guess, got picked up by 690 AM and yeah. uh, announced you as his co-host, uh, I guess, sidekick, you know, radio personality guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was still a cool moment, obviously, knowing that you had played for the Jags and very sure. personal guy with the fans. So it was awesome to, uh, to have you transition into that. Tell me what it's been like getting into sports radio, if that was something <laughs> you ever thought you would do. Uh, hell no. <laughs> and it's funny because I ended up going to school for journalism, mass communications. So, like, that was kind of in my realm a little bit. Um, I never thought I'd really take it, you know, anywhere. But it's a funny story, actually. So, I'm back home on a snowboarding trip over Christmas break, and this was now two years ago. And I get a phone call from Brent Martin, who I haven't probably talked to in maybe two or three years. And, like, you know, Brent Martin was obviously in, you know, when I played on the Jags, I mean, he was always around, you know, he was doing interviews and things like that. And, like, I don't really have a lot of memories of him because I never really interacted with him that much. We had one segment that we did at Adventure Landing, but that was it. But, like, what makes me stick out with Brent Martin is the fact that my rookie year, I remember – uh, that, you know, we're going through, it was the real hazing back then. So me and the rest of the rookies got tied to a goalpost. And then they proceeded to, to throw like water on us and like baby powder. And keep in mind, this is back my rookie year with Jack Del Rio. And Del Rio, my rookie year, he did practices at 10, or I think it was like at 8 p.m. And we got done like at 10 for whatever reason. So it was their late nights. 
So we get tied to the goalpost, man, and pot roast. Terrence Knight and goes, nobody get him out of there. And I remember looking at Brett being like, hey, can you come help me out, man? Because with the medium, like, hey, dude, come help me out. And Brett saw me and just turned his back and walked away, man. So that's always stuck out to me about Brett Martin now. But anyway, so let's fast forward then. So I, I get a phone call around my snowboarding trip around Christmas break, and it's Brent. You know, and I thought he was calling to catch up. And turns out he was trying to offer me, a, you know, the, this gig with ESPN 690. And the way he put it was, you know, you, you, you've always been a very talkative guy. You've always been very personable. Um, you're easygoing. You can carry a conversation. And I want you as a co-host for ESPN 690 radio. And when he first asked me that, I was like, there's no way in hell because I have no experience talking on the radio. I have no experience in that medium, really. And I wasn't going to come on the show and just make a fool of myself. But the way he put it, man, I was in. And I'll never forget what he told me. He's like, you've been to a bar before. I'm like, well, duh, I'm from Wisconsin. Next question. And then he's like, well, imagine that you're sitting on a bar with some of your friends. You're talking sports for three hours a day. And at that point, I was like, say no more, fam. I got you. So... Um, that kind of gave me the confidence where it's like I'm not the, the traditional sports talk host. I'm more of like the laid back, rough around the edges type. But that's what I think me and Brett make such a great team because we're completely polar opposites. And he'll be the first one to tell you that. We have literally nothing in common. But for whatever reason, we we make great, great, great radio together. We have good chemistry. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, that, that chemistry really kind of comes through the uh, the radio dial when you're – uh, listening and you got a good co-host like that being able to bounce back and forth off of so uh, that's awesome that you guys got paired up awesome to have you back here in Jacksonville but let's dive into uh, some 2020 draft talk obviously sure. the NFL draft is still scheduled as planned um, so teams are preparing for that obviously in some weird circumstances but what are your thoughts uh, obviously the Jags have two first round picks uh, what do you think in the Jags should do what do you think they will do with that number nine and number 20 pick yeah, so as far as the number nine's pick's concerned, you know, there's so many ways you can go with this. Um, and there's even rumors of possibly a quarterback talk, all right? There, the, there's no way that I want to see ja the Jacksonville Jaguars in the first round draft a quarterback. Whether it's Tua, whether it's Herbert, or for some reason they go after Love. Like, I just don't want to see that, right? Because, and, and I've been campaigning this for a while now, we don't know what Gardner Minshew is yet, okay? All we know right now is that Gardner Minshew probably had the best rookie campaign of any quarterback so to me I want to see that through I don't want to draft a quarterback at number nine bring him in then all of a sudden it's like all right Mitchu has a bad game now let's go put two in let's go put Herbert in nah man it, you could have something special with Gardner Mitchu at quarterback let's be honest man in in the last decade of Jacksonville football there hasn't really been a you know a, a quarterback that makes you sit back and go wow so I want to see that through worst case scenario Gardner Mitchu is not the guy but like we kind of think he is, well, then you go draft somebody, you know, in 2021. So I don't want to see him go with the quarterback. If it's up to me, honestly, you know, I'm a, I'm a defensive guy. Uh, I stay in the trenches. I wouldn't mind seeing him get Brown or Kinlaw. Um, also, you know, if you if you really want to build around Minshew, then a, then a wide receiver is really um, the pick as well. Akuda is really intriguing to me. Top corner by far, I think, in the draft from Ohio State. The question is, does Detroit take him at number three? If they don't take him, do the Jaguars trade up for him? Because essentially what you're doing, remember, is you traded Jalen Ramsey for two first-round picks. So a goal should be is trying to replace Jalen Ramsey, maybe use some of that draft capital, and try to get Akuda as well. So to me, I either want to see Brown, Akuda, or Kinlaw with that first uh, pick for the Jaguars at nine. Yeah, and I think uh, there's a lot of intrigue with that number three pick with the Lions because you could have a team like the Chargers maybe look to move up to get ahead of the Dolphins to maybe get Tua maybe leave the Dolphins in a position to have to draft one of those other quarterbacks. Um, and then if the Lions end up, you know, having Chase Young sitting in front of them or, yeah. um, you know, Isaiah Simmons to the Giants, something like that, I, I do feel like there's um, typically a player that does slide a little bit. Could that be Okuda or could that be Simmons, depending on how things shuffle? It does seem like a lot of teams do get quarterback thirsty on draft night. The same teams that said we're not drafting one might move up and actually <laughs> take one. So a lot of smoke yeah. screens being thrown out. When you, you talked about the draft capital, ideally, uh, if you were uh, running the draft for the Jaguars, where do you think the Jaguars would look to move up um, with yeah. all that draft capital? Or do you think they're drafting 12 players? You know, anytime you, you draft 12 players, that, that, that's kind of a crazy idea, right? Because you draft 12 players, 
let's say that you have a great draft. Well, then let's say you have maybe six or seven players that actually contribute on the team. Well, the goal, obviously, to build a franchise is to sign those guys to a new contract. Well, that's a, that's a lot of guys getting a second-term contract. So what I would want to see personally is maybe taking some of those late-round picks and trying to use those maybe in future or yeah, obviously this year and trade up for them. Um, as far as, like, you know, trading up and then the first round, like the Akuda guy, you know, from Ohio State, that's the one that's intriguing. Um, you know, there's just so many ways this can go, right? Because we've seen this story before with the Jacksonville Jaguars where guys just follow them. Josh Allen, no one had Josh Allen going to the Jaguars last year. I think Brett – actually, Brett had Josh Allen for whatever reason going to the Jaguars. Not sure if he knew something I didn't. But, no, but mostly nobody had Josh Allen going to the Jaguars. Well, it was an offer too good to pass up, right? Like he was a special – uh, talent, and you couldn't pass him up, even though you had Yannick Ngakwe at defensive end already. So this could be another situation with Isaiah Simmons, where you have a guy who's a freak athlete who can play a multiple um, spot of positions, not really in need for the Jacksonville Jaguars, I think, but he's such a, you know, maybe a once in a generational talent where you can't pass him up. So that's a possibility as well. But I think if the Jaguars do trade up, it's going to be for Akuda only. Um, I think Brown and Kinlaw could fall to J- – obviously, Brown um, could fall. I think Kinlaw could fall to number 20 as well. There's just there's a lot of possibilities this year for the Jacksonville Jaguars, which is going to make it such an interesting draft, obviously, with so many picks. Yeah, and, and part of me wonders if they'll stay at nine and kind of take what falls to them at nine and then maybe use a fourth or a fifth-round pick uh, to couple with that 20th pick and then maybe try and move up to the teens, maybe yeah. the 14 or 15, and maybe get that receiver that they passed on or that defensive lineman. So they're in a pretty good spot. I've talked to a lot of my friends recently and said it's one of the few times that I've felt very confident that coming out of the draft, I'm going to be happy with whatever the outcome is. And part of that is a testament to how many needs we have on the team and how many picks we have in the draft. So it's definitely going to be exciting to see what they do um, in those in those picks and in those spots. So I guess what is your outlook for the 2020 Jags coming off of a 6-10 and 10 season um, obviously below where we want it to be. Um, you yeah. mentioned Gardner Minshew uh, kind of being a bright spot um, in, in such a difficult season that we had, so seeing what he can do. But what's your outlook for this team? Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously when you lose guys like A.J. Boye, you lose guys like Calais Campbell's pillars on your defensive, um, you know, side of the ball, actually just pillars in the locker room in general, um, that's going to hurt you, you know, and you go after – Schobert from Cleveland, linebacker, which I think is a great signing. Um, you know, you had Gunter as well, you know, some, um, some guys that maybe aren't household names, but they can contribute right away. My outlook for the season, like, listen, so to me this is an important season, what, possibly one of the most important in Jaguars franchise history because this is the ultimate, you know, audition now for Gardner Minshew. This season's going to tell you whether Gardner Minshew is going to be the guy going forward or if you have to draft somebody back in 2021. And I think right now the Jaguars' only goal should be to try to surround Gardner Minshew with as many weapons as possible and try to put him in a position to succeed. Because the last thing I want to see this up-and-coming season is Gardner Minshew struggle because you didn't give him the options, you didn't give him the tools, you didn't give him the arsenal to be a successful quarterback. I want to look back at the 2020 season and go, you know what? Gardner Minshew had everything at his disposal, and either he rocks it or he doesn't look that good, but at least we know. That's the biggest thing for me. My outlook overall as a team, um, obviously, I mean, we'll see how this draft shakes out right now, but when you got teams like even the Colts now, the Titans, and we'll see whether with the Texans, you know, getting rid of Hopkins, that was a questionable move, but they're playing in a very, uh, you know, competitive division right now. And I think one could argue the Jaguars probably are picked to finish fourth in division. So as far as my outlook's concerned, maybe six, seven games. But to me, it's all about, you know, seeing if Gardner Minshew is your quarterback going forward or not. Yeah, I fully agree with that. I think it's a a big year that's going to be a testament to the growth of the franchise and also Mm -hmm. seeing if that, uh, I guess, decision to keep Doug Marone and the coaching staff is going to pay off. And obviously they've brought in a few other pieces here and there. And um, it's really kind of one of those first off seasons where Dave Caldwell is going to get back into making his own decisions. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I do think you did bring up a few interesting points about surrounding Gardner Minshew with a lot of pieces. I think a lot of the criticism uh, back in 2014, 15, and so on was the team wasn't doing enough to surround Blake Bortles with enough offensive weapons, and we saw where that got us uh, in in those years. So they built up enough of talent to get to the 2017 AFC Championship game. Obviously not a sustainable enough model, so we'll see what happens 
uh, this year. But again, Austin, I really appreciate you being here. My last question, um, obviously, I just want to ask and see if people uh, kind of, you know, take anything away from this would be what are your thoughts on the whole Yannick Ngakwe situation right now? Obviously, yeah. a very touchy subject in Jacksonville. I don't necessarily know what's going on in the front office's mind or his mind. What are your thoughts there? Where did things potentially go wrong? Yeah, you know, so this stems back to going into last season during training camp, right? And Yannick Ngakwe wants a new contract. And one could argue, does he deserve a contract or not? But the fact of the matter is the guy, you know, was a, was a third-round pick, same year as Dante Fowler. Dante Fowler gets hurt. Jan steps in right away, um, shows a work ethic, shows a drive, a leadership, that blue-collar mentality that you want out of a defensive lineman that you want out of a leader. He hits the ground running and hasn't stopped running since. You know, in terms of, um, you know, his injury history, like it's pretty much non-existent. You know, he obviously had a hamstring this past season, played through it. And I think a guy – like that, you know, kind of like an underdog from Maryland that nobody really knew. People can't pronounce his name right. He comes in right away and, and does this thing and does it with, with just, just the tenacity and relentlessness. Um, you know, I think he was owed a new contract. And if you, if you watch his peers as well, when you talk about Demarcus Lawrence, you talk about Frank Clark, two guys that are comparable in terms of not only size, but also comparable of stats and age. And Frank Clark and Demarcus Lawrence last year. They got paid, all right? And it wasn't out of the realm of possibility for Yannick Ngakwe to ask for that pay as well. So Ngakwe asked to get paid. Um, obviously, Tom Coughlin, uh, you know, the vice president of, of operations, whatever the title that he was, um, they're negotiating. Um, from my understanding, Yannick Ngakwe got lowballed uh, an offer, which was not $19 million, not even close to $19 million. Um, Ngakwe's camp says no. Uh, and then all talks stop happening. And all of a sudden, the, the chain of communication is gone. And to me, that's where, obviously where it started. And then if you keep going through the season, you, you have all these bad optics happening for Jacksonville. You have Tom Coughlin saying, we expect 100% participation here in voluntary workouts. That wasn't good. Jalen goes through his saga. That wasn't good. Then you have the grievance gate, you know, whatever. The NFLPA is telling players not to sign in Jacksonville. That wasn't good. Miles Jack got a new contract. One could say that Yannick Ngakwe may be a little disappointed in that because no one saw Miles Jack getting paid, especially when Yannick wants his new contract. So that wasn't good for him. So these things just started to snowball and snowball and snowball. And it all started when they stopped talking with the contract negotiations to the point where, listen, I don't know Yannick Ngakwe personally. I may have said a couple words to him in passing, but I can tell that he is a very prideful and a very loyal dude. And I think this 2019 season, this past year, it showed that that loyalty was, was tarnished. Um, I think that pride, uh, you know, it was hurt a little bit. And the easy answer would be, yeah, if you're not like Ngakwe, go play in your franchise tag, go make your $18 million and worry about it next year, man. Like, you're going to get your money. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. But at the same time, Pride can make you do crazy things. Loyalty can make you do crazy things. And it's, it's nothing but a foregone conclusion now where he wants out of Jacksonville. So I, I don't think that relationship is going to be salvageable. Um, the biggest concern that I have going forward is Yannick Ngakwe has always been a, g a great locker room guy from everything that I've heard. My concern is does he pull a Jalen Ramsey this year out of desperation and try to do things to not really hurt his teammates per se, but to bring more bad optics on that Jaguars locker room, on that Jaguars front office, because that's the last thing I feel like the Jacksonville Jaguars need right now is more bad press. Yeah, it seemed like one thing after another uh, just kind of kept piling up for the Jags, like you mentioned those examples. And, um, you know, there's so many more questions than answers at this point. And obviously that's due to a lot of privacy and, um, you know, I, I guess appropriate privacy from the front office. Like fans don't necessarily need to know everything, but – from a fan's point of view, you wonder, okay, how much did the Jalen Ramsey situation affect Yannick's mindset? How mm -hmm. much did Tom Coughlin play into this whole situation? And was it an unsalvageable situation from the beginning? Have there been talks since Tom Coughlin left? And then another question that I have is, obviously, you mentioned Josh Allen. Um, he's going to have to get paid eventually. How much is Josh Allen keeping the Jaguars from maybe – uh, looking at a Yannick Ngakwe contract, thinking they might have something better in Josh Allen. So I think there's a lot of questions. Um, something that I've kind of thought myself, potentially looking to trade uh, Yannick and then maybe sign Jadavion Clowney. 
um, at a more appropriate figure. That could be an option um, to still get a pass rusher that they need. But a lot of questions uh, left to left to be answered. So we'll see what happens. But again, Austin, thanks for being here. It's been great having you and uh, definitely looking forward to keeping in touch and, and seeing what goes on in the NFL draft. All right. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Anytime you want to have me on, I'm more than down, man. Stay casual. All right. All right. You too. Have a good one. Later, man.